Good morning. You know, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I was probably five or six years old. I was sitting in the middle seat of our 1990 Chrysler Town and Country. We had a silver town and country. At that time in the early 90s, there were two types of people. There were wood paneling Chrysler Town and Country people and silver paneling Chrysler Town and Country people. But there were only two types of people in the world. Well, we were a silver family. And I remember driving through a country lane in rural Indiana where we lived. And, you know, I was, I was probably five or six. I believe I was in kindergarten. So I was just short enough that what I really remember is seeing the hedgerows zoom by and in the clouds in the sky. And the reason why we were there, I believe, is that we were out picking bittersweet bushes off of country lanes because my mother would use them to decorate with. She would dry them out and make beautiful decorations. My mother has quite an artistic eye, except for the year that she unintentionally picked poison ivy and decorated our house with it. That ruined Christmas, shall we say. That ruined Christmas. Uh, but I remember being out there with her and I had a question. And it wasn't like your typical question of when can I get out of this car, which was my normal question. It was a totally different type of question, a new form of question I'd never experienced before. I remember asking her, Mom, how do we know we all see the same colors? And she answered in an appropriate way, what? And I said, well, we, I was over at the Price family house this week. The Price boys were my age. And they had a little brother who was about James's age, probably three and a half. And they played a prank on him. They taught him that orange crayons were called green. And then when they told him, hey, we were lying, that's actually orange. He was like, no, that is green. And it got me to thinking, mom, what if we all actually see different colors with our eyes, but we, because we call them the same name, you know, we're pointing at different colors uh, that we're actually experiencing. We're just pointing out common colors because we name them the same as one another. Philosophers call that the problem of qualitative experience. I did not know that as a five or six year old. So I said, mom, I can't get inside your eyes. You can't get inside my eyes. What if we all have the same color, favorite color? We just call it by different names. And she said, as good mothers do, well, Timmy, I don't know if I can answer that question. Now, I remember this question so vividly because it kind of spiraled me into the rest of my life of asking those kinds of questions, questions that are not easily disentangled. And those questions have deep existential impact or sometimes they don't. The question of is there objective truth or is it all relative has deep impact on our lives. Does God exist? And if so, what kind of being is he? deep existential impact on your life. If God is all good and all powerful, why does he allow evil to happen? That can derail a human soul. Things like whether or not we see the same color, fun conversations around a campfire, not necessarily that important. But many philosophic questions we have, or if we can't articulate them, feel, do impact our lives deeply. Now, we're in a sermon series on prayer right now. We've taken a break in the book of Romans to address prayer as a community. And here's a hunch I have, because our church preaches quite a bit about the power of God's sovereignty in our lives. Have you ever struggled with the question, if God is absolutely sovereign and he's absolutely good, why do I need to pray? He doesn't need my counsel. He doesn't need me to tell him what to do. And he's going to go do what he's going to do anyway. So why do I need to pray? It's as if that philosophic question takes the Lord's prayer and just chops it off at thy will be done and says everything else after that is just God kind of being nice but doesn't really matter. Have any of you struggled with that question? Has that actually impacted your prayer life? To say, God doesn't actually need my counsel. It might even be disrespectful for me to assume that he does. So I just won't pray something other than maybe your will be done. Well, today what I want to do is look at James 5, 13 through 18. And I want to look at the nature of causality in prayer. And how the Bible seems to have absolutely no concern with the dual affirmation that God is absolutely sovereign and our prayers work. Our prayers do something. Our prayers have power. Now, some of you uh, are, are visiting today, 
And I, I seem like I give this qualification quite a bit, probably too much to be true anymore. But this is an especially philosophical sermon today, so forgive me for that. But I do think that it's actually something we struggle with. There's philosophical questions. How many angels on the head of a needle? That doesn't matter that much. Does prayer matter? Matters a lot. And so first thing I want to do is look at the nature of prayer and God's sovereignty. The second thing I want to do is give a helpful explanation as to why God chose to incorporate our prayers in his sovereign will, that God is actually glorified more in that than if he were to just do it all himself. And then third, I want to look at the power of testifying answered prayers is actually the way that we get past this philosophical struggle into reality, that we share with one another ways God has answered prayer as a way of increasing our boldness to pray even more. So if you would, turn with me to James 5, 13 through 18. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Here's the starting point of prayer in the Bible. It works. Base level. It works. It actually does something. The Bible's God's book. It's his form of self-revelation. It's Jesus speaking to his people, the eternal logos in whom we live and move and have our being, have all of our existence within him. He descends into our realm of existence and says, here's what's actually occurring. And when he talks about prayer, especially petitionary prayer, prayer is where we ask something of God. What is the working assumption? God isn't a liar. He's not into masquerading, and he says it works. It has power. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. We pray for the sick because it can bring healing. We confess our sins and we pray for one another because it can bring forth forgiveness and healing in our souls. Elijah prayed it wouldn't rain, it didn't. He prayed that it wouldn't, it did. God operates in his sovereignty, in and through your freely given prayers for the accomplishment of his sovereign purposes. Let me repeat that. God operates in and through your freely given prayers, freely given prayers for the accomplishment of his sovereign purposes. Now, how can we say that? Because if he's working in and through your freely given prayers, does that mean they're not freely given anymore? And if he takes them into account, does that mean he's not sovereign anymore? So how can this work? How can God remain completely sovereign and our prayers remain free to be given without those two doing some violence to one another? Well, as in most things, you all know who's helpful here, right? Can, we, can you tell me who you think is helpful here? Who might it be, Toby? No, number two. Number three, Thomas Aquinas. Come on, guys. Thomas Aquinas, when we're talking about philosophy, that's who we go to. When we talk about salvation and the sacraments, we go to Calvin and not Aquinas. But with Aquinas on these things, he's so helpful. So here's how he disentangles it. He says it like this, okay? God, we have to view God as the primary agent of everything, as the first cause because he gives everything existence. And that is a cause in itself. Why did that happen? The first answer is because it exists. It wouldn't have happened if it didn't exist. So God is always the first cause of something. 
But then God also operates through secondary causes, things in the created world that interact with one another, like the laws of gravity or physics or mathematics or our actions towards each other. So if I were to take a rock right now and drop it, why did that happen? Now, the first answer, and the most actually deeply philosophical, is because God. That's why it happened. And that actually is an answer. Because God. Because he called it into being, sustained it in being, and that rock lives and moves and has its being within God. But there's also a way of answering that that's equally true. Because God created this world to be governed by the laws of physics, including gravity. And things like this fall down. And so that's a secondary cause. Both are equally true. Now, that's rather simple with a rock falling. But let me give you a different uh, question. This is a purely hypothetical. But imagine we are talking and we are celebrating together that we just read uh, in a... Uh, Christian magazine of some kind or a blog or something, that a revival broke out amongst a tribal people in the heart of the Amazon. Why did that happen? Now, the first way you answer that is because God, in his sovereign will, drew those people to himself. He made the dead alive. He made the blind see. He turned hearts of stone into hearts of flesh so that when they heard the gospel message, they turned in faith. We believe that nobody can turn to Jesus Christ outside of his active work in their lives. It was a great gift of God given to them. And that is a legitimate answer. But that's a primary cause. A secondary cause could be this. You continue to read in the story that a church in rural Pennsylvania had heard about this tribe for years, and they prayed fervently for them. Every prayer meeting for a decade was saturated for these people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And over time, some members of their youth group were so captivated in their hearts by this need to reach this people group in the heart of the Amazon, a young boy and a young girl who got married go there together, and they're killed but they keep praying. And another is raised up and they go and they're killed. Like waves crashing against the rocks, again and again, missionaries are sent. And it feels hopeless, but they don't quit praying. And then one day, a person of peace is found. A medical missionary actually is able to set up a clinic nearby. Somebody comes to receive treatment hears the gospel message and is sent back as a covert agent of the gospel into their village. And at just the right time, a witch doctor dies. And at just the right time, a tribal leader is deposed. And that word of gospel spreads amongst the people and revival breaks forth. That is a way of explaining that story through secondary agency. And here's what we often do we often divide in theological lines of the Reformed churches only tell story A and Armenian churches tell story B. But actually the Reformation, whether that was Calvin, Luther, or Cramner, they believed both are encompassed within the will of God. That he operates in and through our freely given practices, including in and through our freely given prayers. Because God is a different kind of being than you and I. You and I have limited causality. Either I do it or you do it or we do it in a synergistic partnership. But God is the kind of being that he can operate in, with, and through your actions. And they are still remain yours. They still remain freely yours and yet they ultimately remain his. And so why we can pray is the firm conviction that God actually brings about the course of history through the freely given prayers and petitions of his people. We are not in passive engagement in the sovereignty of God, but are in active participation with the sovereignty of God. 
Blaise Pascal said this. I think it's just beautiful. He said, God instituted prayer to allow his creatures the dignity of causality. God instituted prayer to allow his creatures the dignity of causality. Our prayers actually work. Our prayers actually do something. God can operate in, with, and through them. And yes, they are freely given. They they are not his violence upon them, but he is still ultimately the cause of them. And these actually impact the course of his sovereign will. So I'm a millennial. What were millennials told? You can be a history maker. You can change history. You can be somebody that goes and makes an impact. And you know what that normally covertly uh, was? It was a way of saying, well, don't be too pious. You should go engage, you know, in social engagement somewhere. Unintentionally, we lost the belief that actually the way to change the course of human history, to engage the sovereign will of God and providence of God is through a life of communal and personal prayer that it actually dignifies us with causality. It is actually given to us in power. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And so my question for you, have you unintentionally heard so much talk in so many sermons from me about the power and sovereignty of God that you maybe have actually lost some fervor that your response and partnership actually matters. So the first question, how? How do we actually see that our prayers matter? Is that we, God works in and through secondary causes for his purposes. But then a question arises, at least it does for me, why would God choose to do that? If I were God, I would not choose to partner with people like me. I would say, I'm going to sidestep this guy. I'm going to do a workaround, right? I'm going to just get this done on my own, right? This is not a terribly good partner here. So just like, you know, if you ever had a a project in high school or college or middle school or whatever, and you're like, that guy's or gal's not pulling their weight, I'm just going to do it for them. Why doesn't God just do that with us? You ever wondered that? Well, here again, I think Thomas gives a good, helpful explanation. A helpful explanation as to why he would use people like you and me and why that gives him glory. So let's imagine for a moment that I teach my sons about prayer because I try to. We have a saying, suits men pray, right? So suits men pray. Well, we pray before every meal, whether it's mom or me, we pray before every meal. And there was a moment uh, about uh, um, oh, two weeks ago feels like the penny finally dropped. It was about two weeks ago, and uh, Laura was off doing something, and I was making the meal, and I didn't get everything done on time. So I had to get a, a few things done, but I was able to serve them their food. And they start digging in, and I overhear in the room, wait, James, we need to pray. And James like, oh, yeah, we do. And so he put down his, his thing, and he, you know, like this. And then Miles offers a very sweet prayer, giving thanks for the food. Amen. This is how James puts it so we can get to it, right? It's three and a half. Everything's very intense. But they prayed, okay? Would it have been better had I swooped in and said, dad is the one that prays around here. That's my job. And I prayed for them. Would that have been a sign of being a good father? Or do we all instinctively know that it's actually better For, yes, the father to to pray with his children, but then for them to do it as well. That it actually shows more glory and more power and more goodness to be someone who knows how to do something and to raise others up to do it themselves. And so Aquinas says, I think quite helpfully, he has this idea of the perfect being theology, that it's actually more perfect for God, more glorious for God, more honoring of God for him to not only engage the world with his sovereign plan, but also to raise up his creation to partner with him in that. 
You can imagine it with a violinist, an excellent violinist. Would you say that it is better for uh, this in incredible woman who can just play violin like you've never heard before, it makes you weep, to be able to do it, but she can't teach it, or woman B, who can play a violin just as well as woman A, but she also has five or six pupils that are going out into the world, bringing the beauty of music wherever they go. You would say woman B is exercising greater glory. So too with God. He invites us to participate in his sovereign will as a revelation of his glory and his goodness. You know, I've heard it said that petitionary prayer is the lower form of prayer. The highest form of prayer is just glorifying God, right? You are good, you are glorious, right? You know, when we pray acts, we start with adoration. And I think that's true. We enter his courts with praise. Our service begins with blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We begin with a word of blessing. But sometimes I worry that we over disentangle supplication, requests from glorification or adoration, when in reality, our requests and our supplication is participating in the sovereign plan of God, and that in itself is glorifying to God. A way that we give him glory, a way that we give him honor, is by partnering in his sovereign work through prayer. Don't get stuck in the idea that, oh, I feel bad because all I'm doing is giving supplications or requests to God. He created you to partner with him, and that act in itself gives him glory, just as a parent is glorified by their children taking part in what they're doing. The prayer of a righteous person has great power it is, as it is working, and that power brings glory to God. So hopefully that might help disentangle some philosophic questions you have. But here's the deal. Often we can answer philosophic questions, but they don't actually lead to more prayer or they don't actually lead to like a greater sense of God is listening and responding. So what I'd like to do is just give you one practice, one practice that we can engage as a community that can actually embolden us to believe more fervently that God is listening to our prayers and responding to them. And that is the communal practice of celebrating and bearing testimony to answered prayer. I think in prayer in general, this is the thing we do the least amount of. We don't close the loop. I once had a mentor who used to say, the power's on the backside. The power is what you celebrate, and that actually helps grow practices. And so often we don't share answered prayer. Now, we might not share answered prayer because by the time that prayer is answered, we forgot that we asked for it. And you don't want to ring someone up and say, hey, remember six months ago in that prayer meeting? You probably don't remember it, but I asked you to pray for this. Well, God has provided for it. And, you know, we don't want to pester people or, or seen as, you know, maybe self-aggrandizing. But the other problem I think that happens, and this is one that I can relate to quite strongly, is we are afraid that if we share answered prayer, the person that is still awaiting answer will feel abandoned by God. You've been praying for a child, and God has finally given you the baby that you've been longing for. And you want to celebrate that, and you want to communicate God's glory in that, but you are so heartbroken for your friend sitting two pews up who has yet to receive an answer to that prayer. And so you withhold it. Your child has finally come back to Jesus. That wayward son and daughter has finally come home, and you see your brother and sister in tears, still awaiting for their child to come back. And so rather than celebrating the goodness of God, you want to care for them and not heap a feeling of loss upon them. Have any of you ever experienced that before? And this is one of the things of why we've talked so much here 
about relational health with each other. Because in a relationally healthy environment, we can face loss ourselves and still celebrate goodness in others. And I believe it actually requires deep relational trust with one another and a belief that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives to overcome the fear that celebrating God's goodness to us, his answer to prayer to us, the revelation of his providential response to us can make someone else feel diminished. And I'm not saying we have to, you know, that we do have to be very careful with how we do this, loving how we do this. But what I also want to communicate to you is don't think that withholding that celebration isn't also having consequences on the community. We need to hear how God is responding to prayer. We need to hear his providential will lived out in our lives to embolden us to greater prayer and celebration with you. I understand that is a hurdle to overcome. And there are times that you say, that now's not the right time to celebrate this, right? You get a promotion at work, your friend lost his job that week, probably not the greatest thing to lead with that, right? But there is also time to celebrate because the power is on the backside and we grow in our firm conviction and belief that prayer matters and prayer works when we celebrate the ways God has answered our prayer. So here's what I want to say today. This church loves the sovereignty of God. We talk about it all the time. It's, I think in part because I just know how bad of a person I am. And I know that on my own, I would have never had my eyes open to him. I would have never pulled myself up to choose him. It was purely a gift given to me. But would sovereignty not diminish our belief that prayer works, but actually grow it? Because we are praying to the God that can actually do something. We are praying to the God that hears our prayers, loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us, loves us so much he sent his Holy Spirit to fill us up with his presence. And he actually wants to elevate us to be partners with him in the sovereign enactment of his will upon the earth. Let's pray. Lord God, would you grow in us conviction to pray, a firm belief that prayer matters. The prayer of a righteous person has power. Lord, would we have boldness to celebrate answered prayer, to celebrate the goodness that you have revealed in this world, to celebrate the ways that you have bent your ear to us and responded. Lord, would you grow us to become a people of prayer? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.